Okay, we're going to sing our theme song again as we continue. This will be, um, I hear more and more of you joining in now, so that's a good thing. <clears throat> there it comes. Words will be on the screen. Seeking your face, needing your grace and your wisdom. Please come, and Lord, we need understanding that all that you do is faithful and true. Let our eyes see, and let this be. A sweet celebration, love's revelation. You are the center of all that we read and all that we need. A song for the ages in these final pages. Teach us the melody sung by a child. Read, and we will be when you are revealed, and we will be healed, when you are revealed. That's the first time. One more time. Lord, we enter your presence, seeking your face, needing your grace and your wisdom. Please come. Lord, we need understanding that all that you do is faithful and true at our eyes see. And may this be a sweet celebration, love's revelation. You are the center of all that we read and all that we need. A song for the ages, love's final pages, teach us the melody sung by a child redeemed, and we will be healed when you are revealed, and we will be healed when you are Right. If we can stay awake on a full stomach, that will be a miracle, huh? Yep. There's something about being filled and then the sun shining outside and just kind of catches up to you. But <clears throat> we'll, we'll see how it works. If you fall asleep, I won't disturb you. But if I fall asleep, wake me up so we can finish. <laughs> All right. Uh, Margie, come on up. We're going to look at one of Sam Walton's trucks maybe here. I don't know. You've got a little feature for us. <clears throat> I want to tell you two things that I can remember saying when I was younger and even sometimes now I sometimes say it. And if I can remember it, probably chances are you can too. The first one was, I want to do it myself. You ever remember saying that? Okay. And the second one is, probably even more of us can relate to. I can't do this by myself. Any more people with that one? <laughs> I know it's true for me. Are you coming in? Okay. Okay. And your sister, too. Well, we'll give it for you anyway, okay? See this cool, oh, look at your shoes. Aren't those neat? Okay. Okay. Here they come, huh? Hello, kids. So glad you came in. We 
we were just telling, I was just telling the big kids out here that I remember saying two things when I was younger, and I wonder if you have said them before too. I want to do it all by myself. You ever say that? Be honest. Nobody does? All right, you're an honest person. Here's the other one, and I think you probably have said this one before too. Okay, I'll give it back to you, but please don't let them play with it right now, okay? Thanks. Uh, this one is, I can't do this on my own. Have you ever said that? I can't do this by myself. Yeah, and that's really true because we need Jesus to give us all the help and energy and strength that we need, right? Right? Okay, let's... Please, can we just put them away where they won't even be seen right now? No, no. Are they yours? Okay, will you put, put them away in your pocket? Thank you, where you won't play with them. Okay, so here's, see my truck here? We're going to hear a truck story, okay? All right. First, I'm going to have you look at this picture up here on, on the screen. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, there you go. What is that? Yes, a road, and what's this? A bridge. a bridge, and what's this? What's this right here? A sign that says? Okay, what is it showing us? You know what it's telling us? How high up it is? Do you know why it, what? How tall the bridge is. Why does it need to do that? Yes, they need to know if cars or trucks can go under it. And those guys should know how tall they are, shouldn't they? Okay, well, uh-oh. Did that guy know how tall it was? No. He didn't. He wasn't watching very good, was he? He must have been thinking about his girlfriend or something. Who knows? <laughs> uh, let's see some others. Oh, my goodness. Was he looking very carefully? No. Let's see some more. Oh, boy. These guys are in a jam, aren't they? Wow. Uh-oh. Look at he's the same color as the bridge there. Man, what a mess. Would you like to have been these guys that were driving these trucks? Oh, is it? Oh, yeah, look at that. Oh, boy. Sam Walton's not going to be happy with him. <laughs> But he's not even alive again, is he? Okay, so this truck looks kind of like that one, except the back isn't white, isn't it? And that's why I have a red truck, because this is a story about a red truck. That wasn't watching the sign, and he got in a big jam. And right away, the uh, policeman came, because this was a busy street on both sides. The policemen came, and they were trying to figure out what to do, and they couldn't figure out what to do, and they're thinking, this guy is blocking traffic. What are we going to do? And about that time, a boy about nine years old came along. How old? And any of you nine? You are? Oh, wow. Stand up. Let's see how tall you are. All right. Oh, you're not nine years old. <laughs> but that's okay. You could stand with her. Okay, you can sit back down. So a boy your, your age came along, and he tugged on the policeman, and he said, Mr. Policeman, I know what to do. I know how to help you get this guy unstuck. The policeman said, look at us. We're in uniform. We're, po we're police. We know what to do. We're smart that way. You're just a little boy. Run along and play, Sonny. And you shouldn't be out here anyway because I don't want you to get hurt. So run along. So the little boy went off to the side, but he was still interested in what was going to happen. Then the wreckers came, and they were looking all around that truck trying to figure out this way or that way, and they weren't being able to figure out what to do either. Oh, dear, this is just a real bad jam. And meanwhile, all 
the cars are getting backed up behind it, and it's really making a mess for the road and for getting people through. So, after a little while, the wreckers weren't being able to do anything, and a little boy came along that was how old? Nine. And he said, Mr. Wrecker, I know what you can do that will help this man in the truck. And then the wrecker said, Sonny, you don't know what to do with big things like that. That's a big man's job. You run along and play. We don't have time for this right now. We need to concentrate on this. Well, they were concentrating, but they sure couldn't figure out what to do. So they called in the highway engineers. They, too, looked all around the whole truck, trying to figure out how to get this truck unstuck from there. And they didn't know what to do. And it was just getting worse of a mess. But they were sure they'd think of something. But time went on more and more, and they weren't being able to figure it out. And, oh, people were getting frustrated. They tried the police, they tried the records, and they tried the highway engineers, and they weren't getting it. So somebody came along again. Do you know who it was? The little boy, nine-year-old boy. He came along, and he said, Mr. Highway Engineer, I know what to do to help you and to help this truck and to get the traffic going again. Oh, sure, Sonny. You think you're so smart, but we've gone to school for this. We have degrees in this, and we are the ones that are the experts. You're just a little boy. Run along now. Well, he still wanted to see them be able to fix it, so he didn't run along. He stayed on the side, and they weren't getting anywhere doing this or that or trying anything they tried so far. And so the little boy decided to go to a different one. He went up to another one. He tugged on his jacket and his shirt, and he said, Mr. Engineer, I know what you can do to get the red truck going, to get it out from underneath there. All right, Sonny. What do you, a little boy, think that you could tell that we don't know? He says, well, I bet if you just had them let all the air out of their tires, he could be up and going again. Hmm, we hadn't tried that yet. So they did. And guess what? After they put more air and tires on the other side, the guy was up and going and the cars were able to come. And it was all due to the advice of a little nine-year-old boy. Wow, so don't ever think that you can't help but give people advice too, because God uses young people too. In fact, the one he used the very most, we don't know how old he was, but when he was just a young boy, he was helping being a part of saving the trouble that was going on in our world. You know what boy that was? That's right, he was born in a stable. They laid him in a manger, but he grew up knowing and loving God as his best friend, and God gave him wisdom beyond what adults had, and he used him to be willing to die for us, to save us. A young little boy was used to save us so that even though we were supposed to die, he took our place. And because of him, we get to live forever, right? Is that pretty good, That what that boy did? Yeah, I'm thankful for him, aren't you? And I'm thankful that when we look up to him and we're having troubles of our own, here or there or whatever kind, we can say to him, I can't do this on my own, he said. I'm glad you realize that because that's what I specialize in. I will be glad to help you. I will come into your heart, and I will lead you all the way home with me. And that's good news, isn't it? I am so glad for him. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you have the way that none of us have. But as we get together with you and look to you and become friends with you each and every day, 
We have all we need with our best friend Jesus. Please help us to realize every day that we can't do it on our own, but that you can. And please live in our hearts and draw each one of us ever closer to you. We love you. Amen. Thanks for coming up for the kids' feature. You can go back to your seats or whatever you're doing. good sound. Let's have one more prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, uh, we acknowledge that we had a good meal and that the sun is shining and that those two elements can go a long ways towards making us drowsy, but I'm praying that you'd give us spiritual eyeglasses and spiritual hearing aids, that the Holy Spirit would touch our hearts and minds both and that we'd get some fresh insight into the kind of friend that you are and how you are actually all over this book, Revelation. So please open our eyes for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, right off the bat, I'm going to put a, a slide on the screen that we had on the screen earlier. We have noticed that there's a common thread that moves like the scarlet thread through the British Navy's rigging. It goes um, all the way through the book of Revelation and all the way through what we refer to as the three angels' messages. And we looked at one of them earlier uh, in the previous meeting. But here's the common thread. There's a warning against depending on ourselves, self-worship, self-dependence, and an invitation in this book of Revelation to a deeper life of faith instead of works. So a relationship with Jesus instead of simply depending on our own behavior and staying out of trouble. Especially as we come to this time called the judgment. Now we're going to go to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8. And we're going to look at the second angel. We looked at the first angel earlier. Another angel followed saying Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of her, the wrath of her fornication. How many nations drank? All nations. All nations. So that would include the non-Christian nations as well, wouldn't it? That would include Muslim nations, Hindu nations, uh, <clears throat> Buddhist nations. Babylon, therefore, must be something more than a uniquely defined denomination. Sometimes people who are doing presentations on prophecy... T t they, they seem to like to focus in on a particular denomination as being warned against in Scripture, and they kind of zero in on that denomination, and that's something I'm trying to avoid doing because I'm looking for, I'm looking for Jesus in the book of Revelation, and I'm looking for relationship lessons that we can draw from the book that work for all of us, including all nations, regardless of whether they are Christian or non-Christian, either kind. Now, if they all drink, today we're going to discover what Babylon's problem is, and we're going to discover that Babylon's problem can be our problem, regardless of what denomination we might be party to or part of. Babylon's roots go all the way back to something called the Tower of Babel. You heard of the Tower of Babel? Tower of Babel. Um, and if you remember that story, in Genesis chapter 10, it tells us that there was this guy named Nimrod, and he was the king. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, but he was also the king of Babylon, the first king of Babylon. And so the beginning of his kingdom was called Babel. Now you guys know the story of the Tower of Babel. God had uh, destroyed the earth with a flood, but he had promised he would never destroy the earth by water again. However, the people who had been the descendants of Noah didn't trust God. They didn't believe him. And they said, you know, uh, we don't care whether he fulfills his promise or he doesn't fulfill his promise because we're going to make a tower big enough to take care of ourselves no matter what he does. He can have a flood if he wants, but we'll be okay. We'll be dry inside. We'll have all the food we need. We're gonna... They were the original survivalists, you know. Um, there's lots of people who want to live off the grid and going to survive everything that's going to come down as the earth comes, fall, come, starts falling apart. These are the original survivalists. These are the original, we're going to save ourselves. We can take care of this. We can do this. Um, <clears throat> so the problem was they were depending on themselves. Now, how did that go down? How did God feel about the Tower of Babel? 
Remember? It went down. That's right. He confused their language. They were already confused about who to trust and who to depend on. So now he confused their language as well. And they ended up giving up because they, some guy would call for bricks and someone would send up mortar. Someone else would call for rope and someone would send up straw. It just wasn't working. And finally they gave up in disgust. But um, the original Tower of Babel was a symbol of trying to save myself. Underscore that in your mind, depending on myself. <clears throat> and we notice that God caused the tower to be destroyed. Now, if you come down through history and through the ages from the Tower of Babel, you come to a city, and it, it's called Babylon. And the city is, uh, the, is the center of King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar is very proud of this city. Um, he, he actually gets quite inflated with pride and boasts about it. We're going to look at that, too, in just a few minutes. But um, <clears throat> in 606 B.C., he has actually captured... God's people, and they are captives to Babylon. And remember now, Babylon is a symbol of self-dependence, and now God's people are captured in Babylon. I'm going to suggest that the only thing I have to do to be captured by Babylon, however, is to be captive to the idea that I can do it myself. I can do it myself. Just do it. We've got this. Um, you're the man. That, that kind of concept, that kind of thinking is the very thing that Babylon symbolizes. So I don't have to be a captive in Babylon to be captive to what Babylon symbolizes. Um, and this is important because in my denomination, many times when we talk about prophetic literature, we tend to point, as I said earlier, at a particular denomination as being the thing to watch out for. However, if Babylon is a symbol of depending on myself, do I have to be a part of a particular denomination to slip into self-dependence? Can I slip into self-dependence no matter what, I be, what church I belong to or where I go or whether I don't go? I want to read you a little paragraph written by a guy named Arthur Spaulding. And I put that on the screen. He says, most, notice the word at the beginning, most professed Christians believe that they must strive to be good and to do good and that when they've done all they can, Christ will come to their aid and help them do the rest. He says most Christians believe this. You do your part. Have you ever heard this, this expression, God helps those who help themselves? Have you ever heard that phrase before? Most Christians believe that. Even people who aren't Christians think that way. God helps you. You do your part, God does his. You've got to do your part if you expect God to do his, though. God's not going to just step in and do everything for you. He gave you a mind. He gave you a brain. He expects you to use it. You do what you can, and after you've done what you can, God will kick in and can make up for the lack. He'll do the rest. Okay, I'm going to keep reading there. So he says, most Christians think that way. Once you've done your part to be as good as you can, Christ will come to their aid, help them do the rest. In this confused credo of salvation is based partly upon my work and partly upon auxiliary power, God's power, many people trust today. Now, many years ago, I was, I mentioned earlier, I used to be a, uh, an, a teacher, an educator. And before I was an educator, I was working um, as a, I don't know what you would call it, an intern maybe uh, at, at a high school, uh, trying to learn whether or not I really wanted to be a teacher. Yeah. Anyway, so as I was there, I was working at a Christian, a Seventh-day Adventist um, church high school. And there was an evangelist who came to our town. And he was holding a series of meetings, much longer than the ones that we're here for. Uh, he was there for like six or eight weeks. Um, anyway, the principal of our school thought it would be a good idea to have the evangelist come over and, and field questions with the students if they wanted to have some question and answer time. And so I was in a classroom. It was a group of seniors. So these would be like 18-year-old teenagers uh, in high school. And um, the class that I was doing like my intern thing with was uh, Bible classes because I was going to become a Bible teacher um, at parochial high schools. And this evangelist came in to uh, meet the class and to talk with them and to a answer questions if they wanted to ask him any. They were a great class and they asked a lot of really good questions. I was pretty proud of the interaction that they were having with him. And he was giving some pretty good answers. And then one kid raised his hand, young man, 
And he said, I'd like to ask you a question about how to overcome sin. Things got a little bit quiet in the room. And then the kid said, to tell you the truth, he said, I'm not doing too good at it. He said, I keep flopping and failing in some very particular ways that I wish I could get victory over, and I don't seem to get victory over them. So can you tell me how to overcome flops and failures and sin in my life? And I'll never forget what the evangelist said. He went over to the blackboard, and he drew, uh, back in those days, this tells you how old I am, chalk. You know, he used chalk on a blackboard. But anyway, he went over there, and he drew a graph. I want to show you a picture of the graph he drew. He said, when it comes to overcoming sin, we're all different. He said, <clears throat> all of us have certain abilities. Some of us can put out more effort than others can. Somehow just the way we're wired, the way we're born, our genes and chromosomes, we can accomplish more than other people can. We have more willpower, more self-discipline. He says, but it doesn't matter where you are on the scheme of things. If all you can do is put out 10% of the effort that needs to be done, just because that's the way you were born, or if you happen to be one of these kind of people who can put forth 95% of the effort, here's the deal. He says, you do your part, whatever it is, and after you've done as much as you can do, God meets you from the top and he makes it 100%. So if all you can do is put in 10% on the far right, God gives 90 and between the two of you, you come up with 100. If you can do 95% there towards the left middle, uh, God comes in with extra 5% and makes up the difference and you hit 100. He said, the truth is none of us can hit 100% by ourselves. But some of us can do more than others. And as we do our part, God does his. And that's how you overcome. You strive as hard as you can to be a victor. And once you have stri striven, and that may be the right word, I don't know. Once you have done that, God kicks in and makes up the difference. But you got to do your part if you expect him to do his. That was his answer. And that was his drawing. After he'd made that answer, done that drawing, one of the students raised their hand. They said, um... So how do you know if you're a 10 percenter or you're a 30 percenter? You know, how do you know where you are so that you can know how much you're supposed to put out? And then somebody else said, doesn't seem very fair to the 95 percenters. They have to put out more than the 10 percenters. How come they get, how, how come they, how come the 10 percenters get such a free ride? And one after another, the kids raise questions until it looked pretty clear to me that this was a very confusing way of understanding overcoming. It confused me. You know, what's your part? What's his part? How do I know if I've done my part? How do I know if, I, if I've done enough of my part? How do I know if I've tried enough? I can remember as a teenager myself asking other people, so how do you overcome flops and failures? How do you get victory over besetting sins in your life? How do you do that? And I was given all kinds of answers. I was told by some people, it's about the power of choice. You just have to use your power of choice. Everybody has the power of choice and you have to choose. By George, you're going to change. You're going to make a difference. You're going to make that choice. You're going to make the right choice. And if you make the right choice, well, then God kicks in. Uh, I found out I couldn't even make the right choice. I kept flopping and failing. Other people said, you know, it says in the Bible, if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. So you aren't resisting enough. You need to resist more. You need to try harder to resist, resist, resist. Well, I discovered that I couldn't seem to be able to resist enough either. Someone else said, have you ever heard about quoting scriptures when you're faced with temptation? Do you remember in the wilderness when Jesus met the devil? Do you remember he quoted scripture? Well, you need to quote some scripture. You need to have some memory verses in your mind. And if the devil comes at you with temptation, you quote a memory verse and the devil runs off. Well, I tried that and it didn't work. Someone else said, sing Christian songs. When you're having a struggle with temptation, if you can break forth into a song, a Christian song with Christian lyrics, that'll, that devil doesn't like that and he'll leave you alone. Well, that didn't work. I was given all kinds of ideas. Some people said, put a little Bible, a little pocket New Testament in your pocket. And if, uh, if you find yourself facing with temptation, pull that out and kind of like hold it in the face of the devil. Just, you know, kind of like, uh, what is it? With the crucifix with the vampire, uh, you hold out the Bible and the devil will, will leave you. Other people said, take a cold shower. Other people said, count backwards from 100. All kinds of different ways to try and deal with temptation. And I tried them, more grit, more effort, and nothing worked. Nothing worked. If you think about it, every one of those different methods that, I suggest, that were suggested to me 
were all various forms of doing it yourself. Did you catch that? Doing it yourself. The title for this presentation is Do-It-Yourself Religion. Do-It-Yourself. Um, have you ever heard, it's, it's been several years now, but a few years back there was a movement that kind of spread across North America. It was called the WWJD movement. Anybody here ever heard of that? Okay, a few of you. Uh, those, those initials stood for what would Jesus do? And they would have conventions where they would have 30,000 people in a stadium all talking about WWJD and we're going we're gonna, to, you know, live like he. There's a lot of problems with that, but the focus is on my behavior. That's where the focus is. So would Jesus do that? I don't think Jesus would do that. Well, I don't know. I'm not so sure. I, I don't know if I agree with you. I think Jesus would do this. Ah, no, he wouldn't do that. Well, okay, so suppose he wouldn't do it. All right, so he doesn't do it, then we don't do it either. So now we're focusing on our behavior. We're going to act like Jesus acted because that's the right way to go. WWJD. I personally believe that the WW, this might sound a little bit like um, in the face, but I personally believe the WWJD movement was invented by the devil. And the reason I think that is because the devil wants us to focus on our behavior instead of on our Savior. And if he can get us focused on our behavior, we have an illustration we sometimes use where we try to balance a broom and an open palm. Have you ever tried that? Ever seen that illustration? It's pretty cool. Take a broom and open your flat palm like this. Put the bottom of the, the tip of the broom handle there and the brush of the broom at the top. And then try to balance the broom while looking at the bottom. Just look at the bottom of the broom right here. It's impossible to balance the broom looking here. It doesn't matter. You know, you can you can do whatever you want and it's not gonna, you're not gonna, can't do it. But all you have to do is change your point of focus. If you, instead of look at the bottom of the broom, you look at the top of the broom. You can balance it forever. Just look at the top instead of here. In fact, you can put the broom out onto one finger and balance it on one finger as long as you're looking at the top. Try it. Try it later this afternoon when you get wherever there's a broom. You try it. Just don't do it next to um, a, a valuable vase or some kind of glass or something. Because as you try it, the, looking down, it's going to fall. Look up. The devil knows. In the Bible, it says in Corinthians, by beholding, we become what? You know, changed. So what the devil wants us to do is behold our flops and failures for the purpose of getting rid of them. But now where is my attention if I'm looking at my flops and failures, even if it's because I say I want to get rid of them, where is my attention? It's on my flops and failures. So it's like the broom looking at the bottom of the broom. I'm never going to make progress if I'm looking down at my own behavior. But if I would look up, that would be looking to Jesus, keeping my eyes on Jesus. Then it changes everything. And the devil knows that. By beholding, we become changed. The devil knows that. And so he says, um, why don't you behold your flops and failures? Have you ever heard people say, the harder I try, the worse it gets? That's one of the reasons why. We become more and more like what we focus on. Even though it's for the reason of trying to get rid of it, my attention is on this negative instead of on him, the positive. And so I flop and fail. All of these things come back down to depending on myself and human gimmicks. And we read a few moments ago that this is true Almost all professed Christians believe this way. Probably the greatest single symptom that I could be a victim of the do-it-yourself religion or depending on myself is what we talked about in the previous meeting today. 80% of the people who attend church acknowledge that they have little or, low or no daily time alone with Jesus. Now, if I don't have time to commune with him, to become better acquainted with him, to spend in his in fellowship with him, then I'm depending on myself no matter what I say. So self-dependence would be the problem for 80% of us in most churches. Can you imagine trying to be a dairy farmer without any cows or goats? You're going to be a dairy farmer. No cows or goats. Can you imagine trying to be a skydiver with no parachute? More than once. Can you imagine trying to run a bank without money? I suppose you can more and more now because they're trying to do all this bitcoins and everything else. But 
So maybe that's no good, and that's not a good illustration any longer. Let's try this one. Can you imagine being a baker without flour? Suppose you have ovens and mixing bowls and timers and measuring cups. The only thing you're missing is just flour. That's all, just flour. I have everything I need, just don't have flour. How successful are you going to be in a bakery without flour? Imagine trying to be an Olympic swimmer without water. Each case, as I'm talking about it, the most important ingredient is missing. The fundamental ingredient is missing. Well, that's the deal. 80% of us have little or no daily time with Jesus, one-on-one. -on -one. Call it FaceTime if you want. Call it prime time if you want. Call it whatever. But what we're doing is we are eliminating the most important ingredient. Just like you can't swim without water and you can't bake without flour, Spending time with Jesus daily isn't an option if I want to be a Christian. It's the heart of the matter. Something more than once a week and something more than just praying before I eat food. It's the whole basis. It's the whole basis. Now, in that second angel's message, it said all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. I want to put that on the screen because I want to say a word about that fornication thing. So let's put that on see if it comes up. The angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she's made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, you may or may not be familiar with the word fornication, but in the Bible, the word fornication has to do, it's describing an illicit sexual relationship between two people who are not married. That's what the word fornication is about. Fornication. Boiled down, you could put it this way. Two parties that are not in, are not supposed to be getting together are getting together. Fornication. Um, maybe I'll illustrate it this way. I love pure maple syrup. Just love pure maple syrup. Um, I don't like the fake stuff at all. So don't ever try to serve me uh, Aunt Jemima's syrup or log cabin syrup or um, boy, what are some of the other ones? Oh, I don't even care. I don't want Mrs. Butterworth. Yeah, boy, there's just... <laughs> I'm interested in the real thing. This is stuff that comes from trees in Vermont or Canada or, you know, New England. The real thing. I love real maple. I personally think that probably the river of life in heaven is going to be pure maple syrup. It's just going to, and I'll go swimming laps every day and just kind of as I swim, you know. Uh, I could crawl into a bathtub of pure maple syrup and drink my way out. I just love pure maple syrup. All right. So, Sometimes Margie will say, would you like to have pancakes this morning or would you prefer waffles? I say, Margie, it's a no-brainer. Waffles hold more syrup. They have little squares. You can get more syrup in there, right? So I want that. Sometimes Margie will say, how about we try a little variety? Have you ever had this? Let's have, let's have waffles, but let's put some peanut butter and applesauce on them as well as the maple syrup. And I say, Margie, please, no. No, no peanut butter and maple syrup. That would be fornication. Fornication. That's getting together things that weren't supposed to come together. Why would you want to destroy the beautiful flavor of maple syrup by such a powerful, pungent flavor as peanut butter? That's just fornication. No fornication in our house. Please, none. Well, she says I'm getting, I'm trying to get used to it. Um, <clears throat> but back again, boil down, fornication it has to do with two parties getting together that aren't supposed to get together. I was using maple syrup and peanut butter as an example, but you kind of know what I mean. Now, theologians have a theological definition for fornication. They call this syn syncretism, and syncretism is the merging or attempted merging of two antagonistic principles. In other words, trying to make two theological principles fit together, which weren't intended to fit together. Uh, sometimes we talk about things called oxymorons. Oxymorons, they don't quite make sense. Uh, one I've heard lately is um, air, airplane food, as they, they say, is an oxymoron. It's like it's no such thing as airplane food anymore. Ever since COVID, there's no more such thing. But um, 
Syncretism, the, attempt, the attempted merging of two antagonistic principles that are not compatible. Um, when theologians use that word, syncretism, they're trying to describe the strange concoction of salvation that's based partly on my effort and partly on God's power, a combination of divine power and human effort. Now I want to put a little quotation on the screen that I want to read that has something to say about that. Some think they're committing themselves to God while there is still a great deal of self-dependence. It's possible for me to depend upon myself uh, even while I'm trying to learn to depend on God. Nick goes on to say there are conscientious souls. Well, a conscientious soul is well-intended. They're honest people. They're not trying to do the wrong thing. They think they're doing the right thing. There are conscientious souls who trust partly to God and partly to themselves. So that's God helps those who help themselves. You do your part, God does the rest. Conscientious souls, people who honestly believe that that's the way it is. I, was, I saw a talk show a few years back and a guy named Tom Selleck was being interviewed on the talk show, an actor, Hollywood actor. And he made this statement in the routine of answering a question. He said, well, we all know the Bible teaches that God helps those who help themselves. And he went on to make a point. But he was talking as though that's in the Bible. God helps those who help themselves. I think you probably know that that's not in the Bible. That phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is not in the Bible. It was written by a guy named Benjamin Franklin. And it was written in a book called Poor Richard's Almanac. So it's not even in the scripture. But conscientious souls trusting partly to God and partly to themselves, that would have been Tom Selleck's concept, as he said, everybody knows God expects you to do your part, he does his. Actually, they're not looking to God to be kept by his power. But instead, the next uh, slide says, they depend instead upon watchfulness against temptation in the performance of certain duties. So they have their gimmicks, their cold showers, they're counting backwards from 100, they're holding the Bible out, they're singing their songs, they've got their gimmicks to try to overcome sin and Satan. Notice what it says next, there are no victories in this kind of faith. Such persons toil to no purpose. In other words, they're wasting their time trying that way. Their souls are in continual bondage and they find no rest until their burdens are laid at the feet of Jesus. Laid at the feet of Jesus. So, trusting partly to God and partly to myself would be spiritual fornication. Trying to do my part while he does his part. That's not meant to come together like that. And that would be spiritual fornication. Now, I want to say something else about that word fornication. Um, if you think about fornication, the word fornication, outside of the biblical um, meaning, just humanly speaking then, fornication would be an effort. Now I'm talking from the perspective of sexual impurity or immorality. Fornication would be an attempt to have some of the fruits of a marriage relationship without the relationship. So that would be, in a sexual definition, that would be fornication. Now, the reason I said that, I have no intention of talking about sexual things, but I want to make a parallel here that I think is really interesting. In Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23, it says, the fruit of the what? Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Fruit of the who? The Spirit, not the fruit of the person. Now think about this for just a minute. In, in the context of what I just said about fornication, think about this. I said, from a sexual perspective, someone who's attempting to have some of the fruits of a marriage relationship without the relationship is, that's fornication. If I'm trying to acquire the fruits of the Spirit, but I don't have a relationship with Jesus, then nor do I maintain that. In other words, I'm working at having more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, more kindness, more goodness, more faithfulness, more gentleness, more self-control. I'm working on all these things. I'm trying to, I'm trying to become better at these things, but I am among those 80 percenters who have little or no time for Jesus daily. Then what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get the fruits of a relationship without the relationship which is fornication. So when the scripture says, the angel says there, that Babylon is making all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, 
If in my own church, I'm trying to become a better person, but I don't have a daily relationship with Jesus, I am a spiritual fornicator. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm trying to do with these definitions and these words? It's a very common problem. It's a very common problem. They are the fruits of the Spirit. They're not the fruits of the person. Who's responsible for all these things? And by the way, wouldn't you say that when you look at those words, don't those seem to like describe somebody who'd be a lot like Jesus? A person who had a Christ-like character, a person who was a lot like Jesus, wouldn't you think they'd have a lot, they'd be loving, they'd be joyful, they'd be peaceful, they'd be patient, they'd be kind, they'd be good, they'd be faithful, gentle, self-control. That was a Christ-like character. Well, please notice that a Christ-like character is the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of the person. I can't tell you the number of times in my life as I was growing up, I was given the idea that I was supposed to try hard to become more like Jesus. That's not my job. That's the result of the Holy Spirit's work. So if I'm trying to do what the Spirit's doing, um, have you ever seen a bumper sticker that says, if God is your co-pilot, switch seats? I've seen a bumper sticker like that. I like that. I don't want to try and do the work of the Spirit. I want the Spirit to do the work of the Spirit. Which reminds me, fruit and vines. Jesus said in John 15, He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Then He said, abide in me, which is another way of saying, cling to me, hang on to me, depend on me, be in union and communion with me, fellowship with me. He says, abide in me, and I in you, and you will bear much, do you know what the next word is? Fruit. You'll bear much fruit. Did you notice what he said? He didn't say focus on fruit bearing. He didn't say focus on trying to become more like Jesus. He said, cling to me. That's relationship talk. Cling to me. And as you cling to me, I will make myself responsible for producing fruit in you. That's what he's saying. So, it's possible to be involved in Babylon, which is self-dependence, even while belonging to a church that thinks it's figured out who Babylon represents. A particular denomination with headquarters overseas. Well, when you study Babylon, you, you can't really study Babylon without also including its most famous king. I mentioned his name a few minutes ago, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was a giant king of the nation at that time that dominated the entire world. He domi he was, you could say that Nebuchadnezzar was the king of the mountain. He dominated the entire known world. He was a very big and accomplished man. In Daniel 4, verse 30, the king spoke saying, as he looks out at the city called Babylon, this king spoke saying, is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty. Who's the center of attention in this? He is self. Self, right? It's all about me, he's saying. It's all about me. Have you noticed how there's more and more, especially here in America, there seems to be more and more of a move, movement among people that it is all about you. You know, so whatever works for you, that's okay. It doesn't matter if it doesn't work for somebody else. If it's okay for you, it's okay. And so the, the determination of whether or not a thing is considered appropriate is how does it feel for you? How does it work for you? Well, that's okay. I mean, and, and to make a definition for right or wrong based on whether you like it is silly because if you like something that's not appropriate, why should it be considered right simply because you like it? I, I read a story, maybe I shouldn't even tell this because now I'm kind of like tiptoeing off onto a side that I should leave alone, but I read a story not too long ago about a fella, a guy, who went, I, Walmart keeps coming up in my presentations, I didn't, uh, about a guy who went into the ladies' restroom in Walmart. And there was a man who had a 16-year-old daughter and his 16-year-old daughter had just gone into the restroom before the guy did. And the father of his 16-year-old daughter, he thought, 
No guy's going into the restroom while my daughter's in there. Then he went into the restroom after that guy and dragged him out. As he's dragging the guy out, the guy says to him, it's okay, I identify as female. That's what, that's what the guy said. I identify as female. Like that's, now that's justification. So the father said, I identify as the tooth fairy and knocked his teeth out. <laughs> now that's justification, see? This is what I identify as. So the concept is that as long as you identify, then that's good enough. It's not about us. It's not about me. But Nebuchadnezzar seemed to think it was. Isn't this great Babylon that I have built? So it's, it's all about him. That's one of the problems of Babylon. Um, by the way, I want to be a little bit, shall I say, forgiving to, ne to Nebuchadnezzar because he got there naturally. He was sort of just, he grew up with that concept. It's all about you. Um, it's easy to transfer to do-it-yourself religion if you've grown up on do-it-yourself life. And if you think about it, do-it-yourself life is pretty normal. I mean, for example, so little boy, let's say he's five years old. Daddy comes home from work, and um, mommy says to daddy, oh, look at what little Johnny did today. He drew this picture. He is an artist. Like I couldn't believe. Let me show you the picture Johnny drew. So they show the picture to daddy, and daddy looks at the picture. He goes, Johnny, no way. You didn't draw this by yourself. Somebody draw it for you, or you, cop, you you traced it. No, Johnny says, I did it all by myself. Then daddy says, wow, that is so cool. You did it all by yourself. Nobody helped you. That's right, nobody helped you. Well, let's take a picture of that picture, and we will FaceTime Grandpa and Grandma, and we'll show them what you're doing all by yourself. And so we call up Grandpa and Grandma on FaceTime, and they look at here, look what Johnny did all by himself. And they go, oh, Johnny, we're so proud of you. You did that all by yourself. And little Johnny's little sister, Mary, she goes, I do something too by myself, you know. What did you do? I tie my shoe all by myself, you know. Oh, you did that all by yourself. Would you let me take a picture of you doing that? All right, Grandpa and Grandma, look at here. Mary's tying her shoe all by herself. High five, Mary. Way to go. You did it all by yourself. No help. We even, in America, we even have a thing called Independence Day, you know. All by ourselves. We grow up. If you, if you work, if you collaborate with another student on a project that wasn't told that collaboration was appro appropriate, that's called cheating. And you're told you have to do the work all by yourself. It's just conditioned into our way of thinking. Uh, you've heard it here in America. We celebrate. The books are made, movies are made about what they call self-made people. Self-made men, self-made women. They started out with nothing, and this is what they ended up with. And we just we we sing their praises, and we and we we write articles and put them on the on the cover of Newsweek and Time, and you know these amazing people that did it all by themselves. So our culture celebrates independence. That was by 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 the way that was the original sin. You were Lucifer. In heaven? How did he start out? He said, I will exalt my throne above the Most High. I will be worshipped. I will be adored. I will be number one. I will be my own God. It's all about me. That's how sin started. And if we degenerate in our culture, in our society, where it's all about me, we have just pretty much degenerated right into hell because that's what Lucifer started with, that very point. It's all about me. It's all about me. So let's not be too hard on Nebuchadnezzar, because he just grew up as a victim of his own culture. We all grow up as victims of that culture. We're celebrated when we do things on our own, and we're encouraged to do more of the same. There's a song that often uh, celebrities for years would, who are singers would end a, uh, end a concert with a song called I Did It My Way. I Did It My Way. Um, and people would stand up and applaud and give them ovations. 
So we grow up in this kind of culture, and then as Christians, we try pouring grace, that's depending on a higher power than myself, we try pouring grace theology into old wineskins, and in Bible, Jesus said, if you try to put new wine into old wineskins, the wineskins break. They crack, and the wine leaks out. We have a hard time with grace. We have a hard time with freebie. Somewhere in our heads, we've gotten it into our minds, you have to earn it, you have to deserve it, you have to work for it. There's no free lunch. You have to give it your best shot to expect anybody to give you anything back. You know, work for it, show you're serious. And grace says, you can't deserve it. It doesn't matter how hard you try. You can't deserve it. It's a gift. It's a free gift. If I told you, I will give you $20. I will make a gift to you of $20 if you will wash my car. Is that a gift? No, it's a payment. If you have to do something to get my gift, then it wasn't a gift to start with. And salvation and victory, that's a gift which means that I don't do anything to get the gift, except what do you do to get a gift? You come into the presence of a giver and you receive with gratitude what it is that they give you. Well, who's the giver? According to Scripture, every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights, comes from God. So if I want the gift, then I need to embrace the giver. And as I embrace the giver, the gift comes with it. So once again, we come back to this relationship with Jesus being the heart of the matter. Well, back to, um, back to Nebuchadnezzar. He had just said that Babylon was his um, great accomplishment. How did God feel about that? He was given a warning. Nebuchadnezzar said, isn't this great Babylon that I have built? And God said, zonk. And if you read the story in Scripture, uh, Nebuchadnezzar basically lost his mind. He went insane for a period of seven years. And for seven years, he was um, eating grass with the cattle and grew long hair and long fingernails. And he was, he was on grass. I think that would be the first hippie, if you think about it. He was on grass. Anyway, um, for seven years, let's read about it here, Daniel 4. While the word, he'd just been boasting. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom has departed from you. And they will drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and knows what the next word is, and gives it to whomever he chooses. The gift, see the gift? It's not something you earn. It's not something you merit. It's not something you strive for. It's not something you work for. It's a gift. And he says, Nebuchadnezzar, you need to learn this. God basically wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know who kept his heart beating. You say, I did this all by myself, but who kept your heart beating? You know, did you keep your heart beating all by yourself? No, you don't do that. The human race has developed a lot of technologies and a lot of amazing things that we can do, but there's something we can't do. We can't keep a heart beating. Oh, yeah, you can say, well, put an iron lung and do the breathing for him and all that stuff. No, we can't put life where there is no life. It's impossible. And God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to understand that his heart was kept beating by a power bigger than himself. In Isaiah 42, verse 8, it says, I am the Lord, that's my name, and my glory I will not give to another. It's not about what I do, it's about what he does, and he wants to work in me both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He doesn't say, Lee, do your best to stay out of trouble, and then I'll kick in and give you a little extra help, and between us we'll get this thing done. No, he says, just spend time with me. Let's become friends. Let's get better acquainted. Let's talk. Let's communicate. And if we can stay in touch, I will take responsibility for changing your life from the inside out. The burden is not for you. The burden is my burden. All I need from you is your time and attention. Can I have some of that? Can we be friends? That's what he's saying. Philippians 2.13 says, It is God who works in you both to will 
and to do of his good pleasure. He says, I want to work in you in such a way that I give you the right desires and the right actions. I'll make myself responsible for both of those things. Well, you might say, if that's what he really wants to do, then why don't we see more evidence of him doing it? What are, what's he waiting for? And here's what he's waiting for. He's waiting for us to surrender. He's waiting for us to, to recognize that we are never going to get the job done, even though Nike says, just do it. We're not going to get it done. And if we will surrender and say, if anything is going to get done, you're going to have to do it all. And he steps forward and says, now we can make progress. A little poem I came across many years ago, and I thought it makes the point I'm trying to make maybe even better than I'm trying to make it. So I'm going to read you the poem. As children bring their broken toys with tears for me to mend, I brought my broken dreams to God because he was my friend. But then instead of leaving him in peace to work alone, I hung around and tried to help with ways that were my own. At last, I snatched them back and cried, How can you be so slow? My child, he said, what could I do? You never did let go. He's waiting for us to surrender. By the way, the word surrender seems to us to be for losers, but in God's way of thinking, surrender is for winners. Giving him charge is for winners. It's not for losers. Maybe one more story will help make that point a little more clear. Back during the Civil War, and I've heard many people say we may be on the verge of another Civil War here in America. I hope not. But back in the Civil War involving slavery, there was the gray and the blue sides, right? And there was a Union prisoner that would be blue who had been captured by the Confederate Army, the gray. And he was deep behind enemy lines. But he managed to escape by night from the place that he'd been incarcerated. Now, he wanted to get back to Union lines because he knew as long as he was on Confederate territory, he was in danger. So he only traveled at night because he did not want to be spotted or caught. So in the shadow of darkness, he would make his way toward north towards Union lines. And he'd been doing this for several weeks, night travel. And now, based on his knowledge of the geography of where he was, he realized that he was less than one day's journey now, or one night's journey, from Union lines. So he's thinking, almost home. So here comes what he thinks is his last night. And he's traveling in the dark. And he comes to a large, open expanse. It's like a broad meadow, and it's a couple of football lengths wide or deep and miles long. And on the other side of that meadow is home safe. But getting from here to there, he's out in the open. And the moon is shining, and the light illuminates him. And he tries to decide, should I walk the miles either way that I must need to walk in order to get past the meadow and cross inside the cover of forests and trees? Or shall I just go for it? And I guess you could say by this time, all the nights and weeks that he'd been spending trying to get to safety, to see it that close was more than he could handle. And he decided, I'm just going to go for it. Take my chances. And so he went out into the moonlight of the meadow and no sooner did he get out halfway into the meadow than he hears the sound of rifles being cocked. <laughs> and he hears the voices tell him, put his hands, freeze, and put your arms in the air. And his heart sinks because so near and yet so far, there's freedom. But he gets caught before he gets there. And in the darkness, sentries or soldiers come and they surround him. They tie his hands behind his back. And then they start marching in force march, taking him to the prison. It's close to dawn when they capture him. And it takes a few hours to get back to their headquarters. And so as they're walking, the night sky starts to get lighter on the horizon. and The twilight begins to come on. 
And as the light got brighter, all of a sudden he realized that the soldiers that had surrounded and captured him were wearing blue uniforms. And it suddenly dawned on him, he had surrendered to his own side. He was safe. He was home. He had thought that giving up was the end. It was the beginning. And that's the message that God wants to give us in the story of an angel saying, don't drink of the wine of the wrath of fornication of Babylon. Babylon represents self-dependence. Babylon represents doing it on your own. Babylon represents life without the daily walk with Jesus as friend with friend. That's, don't go down that path. When you give up going down that path, you win. That's what this second angel's message is. You win. Nebuchadnezzar had to lose everything before he surrendered and acknowledged his need. You know, he lost his mind. He's out there for seven years with the cattle. He didn't understand that surrender was the way to win. But God was patient with Nebuchadnezzar, and I think that's wonderful. If there's one of the things I appreciate most about God today, it's his patience with me. His patience. He's long-suffering. When Moses wanted to see him, remember back in the mount. Moses said, could you show me your glory? And he said, well, I'll put you into a crack in the rock because I can't, I can't have you just like fall out in front of the glory and kill you. But I'll put you in this crack in the rock and then I'll cause my glory to pass by on the outside of that crack that you're in. And as God passed by, a voice proclaimed, it was God speaking, saying that he was long-suffering and patient and forbearing. And I love that God describes himself that way because I I'm just I need his patience. I need his long suffering. I need his forbearing. God was patient with Nebuchadnezzar, he's patient with you and me. And in the end, Nebuchadnezzar prays probably one of the most tremendous prayers in the Old Testament. You can read it on the screen here. It's found in Daniel chapter four, verses thirty four to thirty seven. At the end of the time, he's referring to the time that he was insane. At the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. Notice that his understanding returned when he's looking at the top of the broom. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him. Praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He has the power to do as he pleases among the angels of heaven and with those who live on earth. No one can stop him or challenge him saying, what do you mean by doing these things? Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, notice what he says next, and those who walk in pride, that would be him, he is able to humble. Have you ever heard the expression, pride goes before a fall? Well, it did with, a, it did with Nebuchadnezzar. But I'm proud <laughs> of Nebuchadnezzar for being humble. Doesn't that sound like an oxymoron? Be proud for being humbled. I had a guy tell me one time that he had, oh, he was proud to acknowledge that he had finally overcome all sin. <laughs> and he said he still remembered the last sin that he overcame. It was pride, he said. <laughs> Crazy, huh? Well, you know what? If God could get could bring that heathen king to his senses, then God can do something for you and for me too. And one day we will join that heathen king, Nebuchadnezzar, in Revelation chapter 15, saying these words, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Nebuchadnezzar started out by saying, Isn't this great Babylon that I built? But one day, Nebuchadnezzar is going to join us as we say, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of Saints. This idea about surrender, I'm going to play a little song and that'll be the close. But this little idea about surrender, even surrender is not something we can do on our own. Believe it or not, 
We talk about surrender, but you can't even say, well then, if surrender is what I need to do, then I surrender. I give God all. We have a song in, the, in, the, in our hymnal saying, I surrender all. As though if we just sang that song, then we'd be good to go. But singing the words, I surrender all, doesn't actually mean I surrendered. Surrender is not even something I can do apart from the power of God in me. He has to make that happen in me. So the question is, am I willing to spend time in his presence so he can work on my vehicle? You take a car into a shop. If you don't leave it there, he's not going to be able to fix it. But if you leave the car in the shop, if he's a good mechanic, when he gives it back to you, it's going to be good. Am I willing to bring my car into the shop, so to speak, speaking of, of, of the Spirit and of God? Am I willing to come to him? I can't surrender without his work, but if I will come to him and spend time with him, he promises to bring me to that point. So this song is called There's Another Stone. It's a Buddy Hotelling song. We've been using several of his songs so far. And um, the, st- the song starts out by Mary of Magdala. It's after Jesus has been buried at the tomb. And she's going to go back on Sunday morning because she wants to be near him again. She hopes to do some more anointing of his body, but she's wondering how she's ever going to get to his body because there's a stone between her and him. And then Buddy takes the song and he talks about self-surrender. And he says, there's a stone we can't move. Can somebody move that stone for us? So listen to those concepts as you hear the song, will you? She spent the Sabbath weeping She and God so far apart The sweetness of the spices in her hand Fed the sorrow of her heart The final act of love for one Whose love had always acted in her need The anointing of the healer of her soul What a painful irony She went down to the place where he was buried She didn't know exactly what she'd find While others hid in silence fearing they'd be next Mary had one thing upon her mind Who's gonna move the storm? There's no way I can see Who's gonna move the only thing that's keeping him from me? I'm fragile and I'm worn Can't do it all alone Oh God, can you tell me Who's gonna move the stone? So many times It seems I'm just like Mary With all the sin and guilt that crush my soul The joy I had in life now dead and buried God, there's just one thing I gotta know Can you still move the storm? I don't know what to do Can you still move? It's keeping me from you I'm stubborn and I try Can't do it all alone Oh God, can you help me? There's another stone Oh God, can you help me? There's another stone
that's the stone mover. He's the one that takes care of the stones that need to get rolled. So I just want to give him more time and attention, and that's what I want to pray for all of us. Let's have prayer. Lord Jesus, forgive us for how easily we find it to just live lives of independence. Somewhere along our uh, upbringing, many of us got the idea that that's the thing to strive for, independence. And it kind of goes cross purposes to the idea of surrendering our lives into your care and in your keeping, trusting you. We'd like to learn to know you better and trust you more. And so please just keep, thank you for being patient with Nebuchadnezzar. Please keep patiently leading us into a closer and closer walk with you. That's my prayer for myself and everybody here. And I pray this in your name. Amen. Tomorrow at 5.30, a meal, light meal. 6.30, meeting continues. And that's the way it will be for the rest of the week, Sunday through Friday night. Then next Saturday, 9.30 and 11, and the series is over. God bless you. May the rest of your afternoon be wonderful, and you enjoy some of the sun that came out to melt the ice that was on my windshield this morning.